Hey, welcome back to another episode of Revealed. This week, we're going to just kind of catch you up on a lot of things that are happening here in the shop. We have a lot going on right in the middle of the workday today. So please bear with the mess and the guys yelling in the background. So this here's the kitchen for our Cambridge project. We've been showing you guys this in a lot of our past videos. And one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, what do we use for drawers in this kitchen? These are actually the Bloom Legra boxes. This is the first time that we've used them on a project. And you know, like with any product, they do have their ups and downs. They are an incredibly smooth feeling drawer, so they operate very nicely. So this would be for like an inner drawer. There's a door panel that goes above this, and then they have the same ones that would mount to an actual drawer front. So we're using a combination of the two. The double drawers is something that we do quite often. So basically you have one drawer front, you would open that drawer front. Once this is open, you have an auxiliary drawer above it to store some additional items. We repeat that a lot throughout this project and in a lot of our projects in general. So we've already showed you a lot of the kitchen being fabricated and some of the little hidden things that we're putting in this kitchen, hence this cabinet. Have to go to a previous episode to find out what's gonna live inside there. But we're actually moving on to other parts of this house now. We're working on some of the office cabinetry as well as some den cabinets. We're using another product in this home that we don't use a lot of. We've talked about the Fenix in a previous episode and now we're actually using an, a laminate. So the laminates aren't a product that we use in our shop a lot, but we were able to source a pretty high quality laminate and it's on a typical veneer core plywood, which is really good for our application. It's what we would prefer to use when making our cases. We're experimenting with it. We're open to using it. And one of the biggest reasons that we are open to using this product is where it's going to live in this home. It's actually more of a utilitarian area. It's a workshop space. So we're okay with using the laminate in this area to kind of try it out and feel it out. As we continue through the shop, we have a lot of other cabinets. We have some that are kind of funky looking and some that are open here. All of this is going to be in the office. So this particular cabinet here is going to house a lot of the AV equipment. So it needs to have some venting to pull fresh air into the cabinet, as well as some release for the warm air out the top. So with this cabinet, we do have a notch in the bottom here to allow the cool fresh air to come in. And then we have this venting at the top. These holes on the top will allow that air to escape. And we have this interesting detail throughout this cabinetry run that will end up having a nice gap for this air to come up and out without ever being able to see it straight on and see that there's a gap there. These two pieces will end up overlapping, but being set back so that it will allow that air to escape without ever able, being able to see in there. Then with our office cabinetry, that detail continues across the top. Hence why these cabinets are a little bit different of a construction method for us. We are going to see the top, so they need to be finished. And typically we would have this open plywood edge on the top of our cabinet, which of course we don't want here in this application. So switching gears a little bit, we have an interesting project that we are just now getting started on. In a previous episode, I explained to you guys some uh, veneer that didn't quite make the cut for us. We have since gotten new veneer in, it's still boxed up. I opened it up and looked at it. It does fit the bill for what we're looking for. I just don't have it laid out for you right now. But basically, once we get that veneer glued up to our substrate, we're going to end up cutting a series of holes through this. It's going to be a sliding screen door. And in between all those holes, we're gonna have this nice blue acrylic kind of shining through there. It's got a little bit of transparency through it. So when the light comes in, you will have just this beautiful color kind of coming through. So switching gears yet again, I have here in front of me some of the more common tools that we're using when we get to the bench here in our shop. So first up would be the corded drill system. These here are the drills that I prefer. I usually keep one set up with a countersink and the other with my driver. And you'll notice that I don't have an impact here. For the work that we're doing, I actually prefer not to use an impact. I like being able to kind of get that feel through the trigger and through the tool to apply the right torque settings for the project that we're doing. With the impact, you lose that a little bit and you can strip out a lot of the screws for the hardware that we're using as well as assembling cases. You can bury those screws a little too easily. So for those reasons, I prefer to stick with just a regular 18 volt corded system. A Japanese pole saw. A lot of people actually reach out and ask me about these saws. So 
they're just very thin. There's a bunch of different versions of these different blades for different applications. Um, they actually cut on the pull stroke and they're just super sharp. The blades are all interchangeable and there's a few different blade types depending on what you're cutting and the application that you're cutting as well as tooth count. So very versatile saw. They make quick work of making difficult cuts and a lot of them are even very flexible so you can make some flush cuts with them. Of course, you wanna make sure you're using the right blade for that, um, but a lot of options when it comes to hand saws. Price. These saws probably run, um, on average, I would say about 50 bucks, but you could probably find them a little bit cheaper, maybe 20 to $30, and probably north of $80 for some of them. So quite a bit of range there. So some of the other hand tools that we're using are things like a chisel. I have a set with multiple sizes in here, this allows me the flexibility to use the right chisel for the application. If I need to get into a smaller groove, I have a smaller chisel to do that. If I need to remove some larger material, I got a larger chisel for that application. And then there are things like screwdrivers, pliers, things of that nature. There's a lot of times we're using things like a mallet over a hammer. Mallets are pretty versatile where they have the soft rubber face on one side and then a harder plastic face on the other. Again, multiple use application here. Things just like that, the router. Probably one of the most versatile tools in the shop. All the tools that we use here are very versatile. Each one can be used in a bunch of different applications and that's why they're probably the most commonly used tools here in our shop. So with the router, we can do a number of different things. There's a number of different bits. So what we have set up in here is just a flush trim bit. We can do a lot with the router from trimming edge banding all the way to adding a profile to the edge of our piece. We can even mount this into a table and add in the joinery for door making. This is something that we had to do for a few years here in our shop when we were first starting. So a very widely used tool here in the shop and I would recommend getting yourself a good router if you don't already have one. Then there's the sander, right? Everything we're doing here is going to be sanded at some point. We prefer to use a six inch random orbital sander. There's a ton of different sander models out there. We like this one for a number of different reasons. It's low profile, which is very comfortable for sanding for long periods of time. This is great for making quick work of sanding larger panels. And they actually have a five inch version as well. It might be a little bit more common, but we actually use the six inch a lot more in our shop. One thing you're gonna notice about the sander and a couple of the next machines is dust collection. While it might not be a tool that is handheld and that you use, having dust collection for all of these tools is paramount and most of them make it very convenient that have a port that plugs right in. And we have several dust collectors that mount to these machines so we can run multiple machines at one time. And then we have our domino. So what this does is it adds a tenon into our pieces. We can add a number of different sizes, thicknesses, widths, depths. Everything is fully adjustable. This is very similar to a biscuit where it adds, these are great for aligning two pieces together or adding a tenon through two pieces for that additional strength. This machine is pretty expensive. There are a lot of other options that get you a similar result. For instance, a biscuit joiner, they can be purchased much cheaper and a little bit more widely available. So that might be a great alternative if you don't wanna spend that much money on the domino. And speaking of biscuit joiners, we have the Lamello Zeta. So if I'm not mistaken, the brand Lamello actually made the very first biscuit joiner. With the Zeta and the P system, it's much different than your average biscuit. This machine can still put in just regular biscuits, but it also steps it up a notch with the P system. And this actually adds an additional notch to your biscuit, allowing a variety of fasteners to be used in this application. This helps not only align our pieces, but actually helps keep them together without any visible fasteners. Tell me about this. No, no, I don't want that. Tell me about this. Oh, the Lamlo? And there's a variety of fasteners that go with this machine and most of those are hidden, so you never actually have to see those fasteners. This is great for things like attaching face frames, and we use it quite a bit here in our shop. So these are some of the most commonly used tools here in our shop. I hope they give you a better idea of the tools that we are working with, and provided some alternatives for getting similar tools at a lower price point. If you guys do have any questions, shoot me a message on Instagram. We do go live every Friday afternoon and we answer your questions or you can always drop them in the comments below. With that being said, now we're gonna roll right into that Q&A. Let's jump right into it, Ken. Sure. Question we got on last week's episode of Revealed is 
involving talent mm -hmm. and kind of building your team in your cabinet shop? Yeah, I think, um, you know, is how are we acquiring talent, right? And I got to kind of pass this one off to Nick, right? He's been in charge over the years of kind of reaching out and bringing people on. He's done a lot through um, right here on social media, whether it's Instagram or YouTube, in bringing people on through here and attracting the, the right people that fit the same kind of work ethic and goals um, and want to build the same kind of stuff that we're building here. And then it's just a matter of making sure that once, once you are interviewing these people, that's the most difficult process, right? And it's something that I have a hard time with. It's, it's difficult to interview somebody in a situation you know, like this, right? Mm -hmm. To do a hands-on type of job. And right. anybody can kind of put on their resume that they have experience in this or that they know how to do that. But it might be very different when you get them here into the shop. So that's very difficult. I don't have a great answer to that. Um, I guess just kind of trial and error, do a little bit of your own due diligence and research into the person, you know, same as they're doing to your company anyway. So just follow them on Instagram, kind of take a look at their work through there and just kind of gauge that as best you can from, from their social platforms. All right. Here's a question. It wasn't specifically in last week's episode, but we have gotten it quite a bit. So different levels of shops someone who's just got a wood shop in their house because they enjoy it, you know, weekend warrior type of thing, mm -hmm. maybe an entry. <laughs> What's up? I was just thinking about another comment because your eyes are closed for a second. <laughs> uh, entry level. I'm not high. Just FYI. Uh, it's just how I look. Thank you for pointing it out, though. Um, weekend warrior um, type, pro, uh, type shop, entry level pro shop, mm -hmm. high end pro shop. What tools are you investing in? Kind of walk me through each level. Like where should, where do you get the most bang for your dollar? I think the fundamentals or like the, the tools are all the same throughout each different um, level. <clears throat> it's just a matter of what tier of that tool you're getting, right? So the weekend warrior in his garage or his basement at his house, you're gonna want a jointer, planer, um, a decent table saw, you know, those types of things. and that continues to grow as your shop grows and you get a higher level, you know, the saw that we talk about a lot is it's a 10 foot sliding table saw. And obviously that can't fit in everybody's garage. You know, it's 16 feet one way, 20 something feet the other way, very large piece of machinery. It can't fit in everybody's shop. So you're going to start off with something smaller, like a standard table saw with a cross cut sled, right? In a garage shop. As you get into a bigger shop, you can get into a slider like this or even bigger, you know, a full-sized CNC or a larger slider. They do make them larger, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> and then you're gonna start to add in, you know, some of the, the more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the, the tools, like the mini press that we have to drill our hinge bores, the hinge mortiser, um, the line bore machines, like the luxury kind of tools that do make life just so much easier to have, but you can't necessarily fit them in a small garage shop and they're not um, the first priority of a tool when you are in a small space like that. So it sounds to me like it, it's really a kind of a key tool is the, the sliding table saw or a, a good table saw. Kind of to build around that. Really? Yeah. Kind of the nucleus? Yeah, I mean, I 100% I would say slider is the, probably the, the most used tool and, and the best bang for the buck, but they are very big and they are very expensive. So a smaller saw with some of the crosscut sleds are pretty nice that are out there now. You are a little bit limited in your um, capacities with something like that. But again, if you're working in like a shop, a small uh, garage shop, you're not gonna be taking on these massive projects that you're going to be limited by the capacity of the saw. First five years of the shop, mm -hmm. where do you think the biggest hurdles have been? And is there any, any advice you can give to somebody to kind of... Hmm. I think... Uh We've had a lot of kind of difficulty in finding our, I guess, groove or niche and building that team, right? We're still um, niche? niche, niche, what the heck was that about? Um, and, and kind of, you know, building that team, building the shop, getting the equipment that you need, um, but also coordination and communication and just making sure that you are you know, attacking this from all different angles and all different sides, right? You can't just do 
one thing really well, you have to make sure you're communicating with the entire team. And that's been a process for us, a huge learning curve over the, the last five years. And it's probably the biggest um, reason for us doing rework is just miscommunications between us, the field, mismeasuring on site, um, you know, keeping that, I guess it all comes down to just communication. Yeah. Uh, thoughts on SawStop? SawStop is, they have the technology where like, if it even senses like skin or something, yeah. it just shuts the saw. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know. Yeah, it, great saws. I do wish that they had uh, released the patents for, you know, other saws to be able to do this. Right now they, I think Bosch maybe, another brand tried to make one, ended up having to shut it down. But if we could take that technology and put them into a lot of the same tools that we're using today, it would be a game changer. Um, unfortunately for the, what we're doing, SawStop doesn't make a saw that fits the bill for us. They are actually one of the manufacturers of um, a decent uh, crosscut sled, like I was just talking about, for your table saw. So their system's pretty good for smaller shops. It is very expensive, mm. um, but a great system and a, a great idea in general. Home shop, want to do veneer work, don't want to invest in vacuum equipment. Uh, spray on PSA, advisable? Um, you could go that route. I know the vacuum system that we use, it's very large and it is fairly expensive. They do make a lot of much smaller, much more affordable kits that you can buy for you, like your home shop. Right. Um, and you can get into it for just a few hundred bucks, which I know can still be quite a bit of money. Uh, but the results you're gonna turn out versus like spraying a contact cement or something, are gonna be much better, much easier, much cleaner. So I would advise you go that route. I think we have done a video on uh, specifically vacuum bags. Mm -hmm. I can put a link in the description on YouTube. Um, something you talked about where it's it's not an un, it's not an unattainable entry level. Yeah, and you can kind of roll it up, store it, get it out of the way. It doesn't take up. Yeah, I mean, we even do that with our bag, right? Our, the bag that we're using in our shop it's um, ten feet by five feet. So we roll it up and we store it under a table that we've actually built just for our veneer stuff so that we can use it as a multifunction space. We are a much bigger shop than a garage, but we are a very tight shop. Space is very limited here and we need to have a lot of multifunctional spaces. So that table and the ability to roll that bag up and, <clears throat> and tuck it away is, is great. And this is a large bag. A lot of you know garage shops or whatnot are going to be using much smaller bag, it rolls up into a much smaller package. The pumps are much smaller and just a great way to get started in veneering. Do you have a go-to go -to brand for uh, a saw? No, not, not a go-to. We're, we're running a Cantec. Um, I mean, there's Felder's, Altendorf, um, Martin's, of course, for the higher end sliding saws. And then for the more affordable, smaller saws, you have the saw stop. Um, we're running a Delta. I don't think they actually, not sure if they make those anymore. They've been mm. bought a few times, I think, for now. Um, Powermatic are great small saws as well. So there's there's a lot of different options there, depending on your size you're looking for and your budget. Content, you're you're starting to dabble in making your own content. <laughs> yes. Where where do you where would you suggest somebody kind of start? There's a lot of people that just don't. They have they're doing great things. They're very talented at what they do. And I just, they can't find that starting point. Here at NS Builders, you know, we kind of are that starting point because right. Nick has facilitated us as a platform to help people sure. get started. Yeah, I, but I, I, I'm glad you kind of prefaced it with that because I think a lot of people will look at this and be like, oh, you guys already have, we have a video guy. We have tons of great equipment. If I wasn't here. And, but me branching off on my own, doing it without you, it's tough. It's so hard. Um, like you make it look so much easier than what it actually is. But what I would say is, you know, my thoughts are like, oh, I don't have the equipment to do it. I need to buy a camera like this. Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily. There are plenty of people are doing it on their phone and we all have, you know, great phones right now. To get started, use your phone. A few of the things that I've purchased were a couple of mounts so that I can mount the camera to the desktop or kind of float it here so that I can watch what I'm doing. And then, um, really you're into it and the stuff that I bought it's just kind of cheap it's entry-level stuff because I don't really know what I'm doing um, and as I advance I'll pick up nicer stuff if it's something that I stick with at all right yeah. so just like accessories like that mounts and what have you 
and then you need to edit it, right? And Sometimes we, overlooked. We've had a lot of conversations. <laughs> with it. I, I think that's probably the biggest, right? Because everyone thinks the camera. Oh, I see the camera. So I need a new camera. Has the invisible art. But it's like, great, you have all this footage. Now what? Yeah. It's just not magically this, this, right. this um, how-to video. So I started with iMovie just because that's what my computer came with. Very quickly realized I'm very limited by iMovie and I can't do <laughs> what I would like to do with that program. And after talking with you and a lot of bunch, a uh, bunch of other people who are doing video content, um, pick their brains about different programs that are are a bit more powerful mm -hmm. on the editing side, and made the investment. And it's only like it's a few bucks a month, right, for these programs. But if you don't stick with it, you you know you're not losing a ton of money. It's not like you're buying a a six thousand dollar program. Yeah. right off the bat you know it's it's become very accessible recently yeah like 20 to 40 50 bucks a month and you can have this program um, and all the other programs that support that one so your options are are just limited by your ab abilities and skills yeah but i've been doing a lot of just same thing right youtube how to's and like asking you for hey how do i do this how do i do that so yeah. equipment um more like accessories you could probably use your phone maybe even a dslr that they have at their house um, then a, an editing program and then an invaluable resource would be someone that you can kind of lean on for editing advice or shooting advice. So I reached out to Doug, I've reached out to numerous other people who are doing video creation as well that I've met through here on Instagram. Um, and just rely or use the resources that you can. And just to kind of, so when I came out of high school 2007, I don't know if that's young or old to anyone, but to get into a non-linear editing system like Final Cut or at that time it was pretty much Final Cut, Premiere, Avid. Anyway, it was expensive. Mm -hmm. It was like at least $1,500, $2,000 and then you needed to have a computer that could support it. Right. Now, most laptops, whether it's Mac or PC or whatever, mm -hmm. you can get Premiere for 30, well if you just wanted Premiere for 30 bucks a month is that what it is? I think so. Oh, I, I did the it, you could Getting around to, if you didn't want to invest in it for a year, you could try it for a month, see if it is something you want to do, and then it's it's just a $30 flyer. Yeah. But Accessibility. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a couple different ways that it's fairly affordable to, to get into it without investing a ton of money in cameras and lighting. Oh, audio. That's a big one that we skipped over, too. Oh, yeah. Um, and this Another is something overlooked. that I'm going through now too, is trying to find the right audio and one that works with the phone, works with the programs and, right. and sounds good too. So, um, and, I think, and I think you've also discovered how expensive video equipment is. Yeah. Yep. Ken, has, Ken has been complaining to me like, hey man, this is like $150. Like, yeah, that's a one too. <laughs> yep. yep. Anyway, where did you get your start, Ken? In uh, cabinet making? So I uh, grew up with my father being a carpenter and have just kind of been kind of going back and forth with carpentry since uh, being in school and then actually left college, didn't, didn't want to pursue woodworking, um, bounced around with a few different things, other career paths, ultimately landed back into a shop and that was 12-ish years ago and I've been here ever since. Crushing it ever since. Um, do you have any intentions of doing an epoxy river cabinet? <laughs> no intentions. <laughs> I think she did say that kiddingly. Or he, sorry. Let's end it on this. What are you excited about in cabinetry right now? What I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, and people are reaching out to me about it, and I know they're reaching out to other people, and I re reach out to people, is this collaboration between cabinet makers, right? It's there's no longer, I shouldn't say there's no longer, there's much less of a competition. And it's more of like, hey, how did you do that? I would love to learn that. And then they take it and watching what they do with that. And then it's like, wait, how did you do that? You know, and it's just this constant evolution and collaboration. And it's just like, it's exciting to see because we're, we're constantly pushing each other. You know, where, what's next? Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's going to ultimately push us to build and create some really, really interesting and great products. So you're seeing a more collaborative, uh, just, that was a fly, just uh, <laughs> to the light. came out of nowhere. <laughs> um, you're seeing more collaborative effort as opposed to competitive. Yeah. 
it's, I think there's enough work to go around, you know, right. essentially. And it's not even just like people in a market that's, you know, I'm going to pick on Matt because, because it's Matt, right? And him and I have chatted a lot about this kind of stuff. And he's in Florida. I'm not worried about losing clients to Matt, right? Like we're never going to have the same client pool. Right. <clears throat> and even then there's a lot of, you know, cabinet makers here in town that we have the same conversations with. Right. So it's like, you know, there's, like you said, there's plenty of work to go around and the more that it, it pushes us to, and this is something that Nick has talked about for years, right? It pushes them a little bit further and how they can evolve their skills, mm -hmm. which keeps me at the top of my game and makes me want to push to, you know, oh yeah, I showed you that. Yeah, I'm way beyond that now. I know something better or, you know, I'm on to the next thing. So it kind of pushes everybody to do a little bit better and uh, always kind of striving for the best. All right. Oh, all right. Thanks for watching, cool. everyone. See you guys. Bye. You know, we just need that dead blow action. No.